Welcome to the episode of Get Close. I'm Gio. I'm Bart. And what are we talking about today, Bart? Today, we're talking about finances. What do you know about finances, bro? Not very much because I'm an idiot, but I've learned a couple things along the way. Like what? So recently on Instagram, I posted, hey, what do you guys want us to talk about? And a lot of people actually want to learn about finances, investments, yada, yada, yada. And I think it's because a lot of the demographic is aging, mm -hmm. right? Like people that are 18 are turning 19, people 24, turning 25. So they're moving into that next bracket, that new phase of life from high school to college, college to like early working, early working to like young families buying their first homes and stuff. And like us. I know, and it's been so rad. Like when I meet people that watch our content, they're like, I grew up on you guys. And I'm like, that is so fucking tight. Yeah, they go, I've been watching you since junior high and they yeah, have yeah. a full fucking beard. I'm well, like, what the fuck? The point is that they've seen us grow yeah. and they've seen our life grow and just kind of the lifestyle that we live and um, and they admire that and they're like, cool, like that's inspiring. Yeah. So it's really cool that you're about to share a bunch of the steps that we've taken um, to move into our next phase in life because we've moved in phases. Like yeah. we were in high school that went to college, college to start up our own shit, super fucking broke and then got super fucking money and then lived super fucking dope and then going, ooh, what do we want and what don't we want? And what's the next phase? Because now we're getting old. I'm about to be 40, bruh. Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. And I don't 40. feel... 40. That doesn't even bother me, honestly. Like, the number doesn't bother me at all. It because I know me. <laughs> well, that's your problem, son. Um, It doesn't bother me at all because I'm your like... Your pussy's still 25, though. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. <laughs> well, that... And I don't feel 40, right? Like, I don't move like a 40-year-old. I don't even know what that's supposed to be like. But I just... I feel so young you at heart. Do you have to put chapstick on your vagina? Do I? Is it dry? Do I? I did hear a cough. Like, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you have a baby and then fucking have it be fucking dripping wet. And you also look like you're 40. So maybe work on what? yourself. No, you look great, I too. I look fucking good these days. Yeah. So whenever I hear that 40 comment, it doesn't bother me ever. But there is definitely I do feel a shift in my life happening where yeah. I'm like, yeah, I ain't trying to work like this. Yeah. Yeah. So um, before I get into the way I like to do things. Um, I always like to shout out the actual experts, the gurus. So the people that I listen to religiously is uh, Graham Stephan, uh, Minority Mindset, Bigger Pockets, and Dave Ramsey. Thatch. Thatch you in with the real estate. Because you're stuff. always texting him. That's true. So those are probably the main five. Um, if there's someone else, I'll remember to put the name in um, right after. But if you guys want expert information. These are the guys. Um, these are the five guys. And I would say the reason why you would want to maybe listen to what I have to say and um, can take from it is because these guys are experts and sometimes they're a little bit unrelatable and they're giving information at, at too high of a level. I feel like I'm like a newbie, a newbie, a newbie, you know, so sometimes like the blue belt can teach a white belt better than a black belt can. For sure. Yeah. So. Because you, you don't know how much you know. So you're explaining at such a high level that you might be forgetting the in-between steps. Yeah. And I literally was just a white belt. So I'm like, oh, I could tell you some of the struggles I literally went through like last week. Okay. So I would say um, our entire finance investing journey. Um, well, I got to shout out my mom too then. Because uh, as a kid, I think that because a lot of the things that you do as an adult is a result of some of the habits you built as a kid. And I remember as a kid, um, I would always get like Chinese New Year's money birthday money, stuff like that. And my mom never let me spend it. So I actually hated her for that during that time. Cause like all my friends can go and buy stuff that they want, like a Nerf gun or whatever. Where are they now? I don't know. I don't talk to them. Oh, um, actually one of them became Graham. Mom's Graham Stefan now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Imagine. <laughs> and, uh, I just hated that, you know, but one of the habits that, she built with me is back then there was no ATMs. You would go to the bank. Oh my, there was no ATMs. You have to go in the bank in person and talk to a teller. ATM is a new thing, bro. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Maybe you worked it. Cause I remember being in elementary school and there was drive through ATMs. Yeah. You're 40. Yeah. You're fucking 39. Don't act like you're fucking 20 years younger there than me. There were no ATMs at that time. The ATMs was a new thing that came out when I was like in middle school. Sure. 
When I was like in first grade, there were no ATMs. All right, fine. Now I got to look this shit up. Go. So we had to go in and then you have to talk to a teller and they would give you a banking uh, booklet. Do you remember that? It looks like a passport. Yeah. Where Mexicans are probably poor, so you never had anything like that. <laughs> but there's a banking <laughs> booklet. And so it's like a passport that's hardcover and it looks like an official document. So every time we would go in, we would deposit money and they would take that thing and then scan it through the, the thing and print out almost like a new balance every single time. Why do you have sour lips? Uh, so by the 1980s, these money machines had become widely popular and handled many of the functions previously performed by human tellers. So if you were born before the 80s, then I'll give you that. But you were well into the fucking 90s. Well, they weren't rolled out then. Okay, buddy. Go. Look at when the fuck a debit card was first issued. Debit card is different. You need a debit card to no, access you don't. the ATM. No, you don't. How do you access the ATM? You do not need How? a debit card. How? How do you access it? Uh, go you to, can go have access a, one right now. No, you can have a, it's called like a savings card, like a bank card, but it's not a debit card because a debit card denotes that it has like a Visa or a MasterCard logo that now you can pay in different fucking stores. So debit is different. You don't even know about Sumitomo Bank. I don't care about Sumitomo Bank. <laughs> <laughs> Go, you bitch. <laughs> okay, so we used to have this, these banking booklets. So I hated my mom, but we developed these habits. We would go and save money. And I remember by the time I was like 10, opening it one day, and it said like three grand in it. And wow. I'm like, wow, my mom did that wow, for me too. Wow, that's why we, we needed to do that. So I hated my mom for 10 years, but, but, we, you're saved, smart but we saved so much money then. You're smart because you saw that as a valuable thing and going, yay, my mom would deposit 20 bucks into all her kids' accounts every yeah. single month. Yeah. So when I finally got my savings card because yeah. that's all i had a savings yeah she had about two thousand dollars saved for me and i was like sick let's go buy dumb shit yeah well for me i think it, she built the habits that's the thing you got to exercise and do it she took me to the bank oh no mine was just showed up and it just yeah was you have it to, to do me. it like we'd go got to it. the bank and we lived in cerritos and we would drive to monterey park because that was where the only i think like asian banks were so it was like a, a whole thing. Like, okay, That's this weekend, so cute. we have to go do this. I'm doing that with Taika now. I know. He doesn't hate me yet. No, but you let him spend it, which is good. Oh, right, right. Like but he, I'm also, I'm breaking it up for him. Yeah, so it's not really about the spending or saving. It's the action of being uh, financially present. You know, like looking at the money. Don't want to give some away. Don't want to save. It's that making yeah, those yeah. decisions, not the actual saving that um, creates the financial intelligence. So Got my it. mom helped me build those habits by doing those things. And then um, when I got older and I started getting like an uh, allowance, my mom would always go save half, save half. So every time I got like 20 bucks, I'd put 10 bucks here and 10 bucks into like another thing. How did you, what's another thing? What's another thing? Oh, so you remember how like uh, checking books came in that like little carton? Yeah. So in my drawer, I would take the top and the bottom and put it like that next to each other. Would your mom so count put, to make so, sure? So I'd put 10 bucks in this one and 10 bucks in this one. What? And how I would old watch, were you? And I would watch them just stack up and how they like change. How old were you? Maybe like ele late elementary, junior high. Damn, I would never. Why? I just wanted to spend it all, and I would. Because my dad would do the same shit, but he wouldn't give me allowance. Yeah. It would just be whenever he felt like, oh, I hadn't given this bitch money. He'd give me like 20 bucks or 10 bucks. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he would say like, hey, make sure to always have money in your wallet. And I never did. Yeah. Because I spent it all. Yeah, no, we, I would try Damn. to like watch it stack up. And once it got to like a certain amount, we would go to the uh, bank and deposit it. That's awesome. So like once again, building habits and always uh, saving half, saving half. Yeah. So then later on, when I started watching like different financial channels and they're like, save 10% or 20% or 30% of your earnings, that was easy because my mom yeah. set the bar so high. You know, and then she set the bar so high where you save half. Yeah, because that was 50%. Yeah, and the ballers that I looked up to, like Jay-Z, always said, if you can't afford two, you can't afford one. So if you want to buy a Roly, can you buy two? If you can't, you can't even afford it. Yeah. Because you should be spending money that is like... Negligible. That disposable to you. Yeah. So those things just aligned. So starting with, I would say, like, I started making real money probably... Um, 2013? Maybe yeah, 2012, 2013 with JK. Yeah. And um, it was easy for me to just immediately start saving and putting money away. And then as soon as I had money that was more than I kn knew how to spend, because, you know, like your lifestyle grows with the amount of money. Of right? course. So at that time, like we just had like a regular car, like a you had a Honda Accord. I had like a Durango or whatever. And so um, with my mom teaching me these little habits early on, 
it was easy for me to go, okay, what's the first thing I should do? I should start investing in a time period that I am completely not prepared for. So every single time we met with our CPA and he was saying like, how much do you want to put into your retirement account? I always go full amount because number one, so this is one big, uh, one first, I would say key item. When you have a retirement account, depending on the state, you always have a maximum amount that you get to put away into that pre-tax. And you want to take advantage of this because you are going to, so like when you get money, like let's say a hundred bucks, when you get taxed, it turns into 70, right? If it gets taxed at 30%. So now you have to deal with uh, only $70 and you pretty much just lose out on the 30. Yep. But if you're able to move money aside pre-tax, so like let's say you can move 30 bucks, now you only have to get taxed on the 70 and that 30 bucks you get it's to put still away. Yours. It's not 30 that turns into 20, it's 30 that's still yours I get to use later. So um, with retirement, as early as I can, I've always been put uh, into my brain. When you're able-bodied, you want to start setting yourself for when you're not able-bodied. So every single year for JK, my taxes and your taxes, always the full amount I want to deduct that's able to be pre-tax money and put that away. Now to this day, which is like... Um, 10 years later? Yeah, almost like 10 years later, our retirement account has almost a million dollars in it, which is pretty fucking crazy. I know, and I've never missed a single one of that money that went in there. Yeah. I'm never like, oh, man. Yeah. So that's one thing that like money can grow fast, especially when they put into those retirement accounts. What's the compounding interest, right? Yeah, they're technically like, like almost like mutual funds or like ETFs. They're like just these, you're technically buying like a really safe stock. So the more time you can put behind you, the more time you have for it to grow. Because like an Apple stock, if you look at whatever it is 10 years ago versus what it is now, it's way less. When it's great to be able to put money away when you can. Yes. So if you're able to, able then body. do it. Yes. So, well, not even able body, because able body meaning that you can still earn it. I'm saying you're living a lifestyle that allows you to even save, right? Because like you can be, Remember when we were starting, we couldn't afford fucking gas. There's no way we're saving. We yeah, still yeah, had, yeah. I still had debt. Yeah. I'm like, how am I going to save money when I still have debt? Like that doesn't make any fucking sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then I also learned like one of the biggest things with finances is learning like loopholes, not even loopholes, but learning strategies. Yes. So with the retirement account, I have also learned you can technically, you can't crack it open until you're 55 or 60 or 65, depending on the state, right? If you do, then you have to pay the penalty fee and then you have to pay taxes on it because you moved money pre-tax into there. But if you have, uh, if you're able to take it out and put it back in with the same month, did you know you have zero fees? I don't remember that. So that's one of the key things. So that's why it's like when you, when you look into these different funds or any type of investments, look at the strategic implications because that, because now you're banking yourself. You know, when you're like looking at something, oh, I really want to buy that house, but that deal has to happen now. If I don't make it happen now, then um, I'm going to lose out on this crazy opportunity, the yeah. 10X. Well, guess what? If you're very sure about this, if you can get this million dollars out, make this deal happen, make the money and put it back in, you technically just banked yourself for 30 days, which is something that is amazing. You know, so like being able to know like, okay, not just like save into A, but A can also mean B, C, D, E. That is where like the true finance strategies come in. So um, the retirement account has a million bucks, but technically we're also able to bank ourselves a million bucks if anything happens. And also I also learned if... Uh, and also I've also learned... Yeah, and also I've also learned that, uh, that also if you have a family emergency and then that makes you tap into your retirement account, you don't have to pay ten wow. tax I think either. you can do that also with your life insurance. That one too. Which I'm like, What? So there's a lot of like those things that are very, very helpful that you should look into. So for those of you guys, I would say step number one, um, I always look at my, my life, uh, my finance life, my a life. Quarter, a quarter mile at a time. Yeah. Um, and it's all about family. No, I, no, I always <laughs> look at um, my life in buckets. Like what's my now bucket? What's my 10 year bucket? And then what's my retirement bucket look like? And then making sure I'm putting deposits in all of them. And then so a lot of times that just naturally uh, spills over spills over and has a parallel into risky investments, medium safe investments, and extremely conservative in investments. I mean, it's the same when you're saving too. Like you can save for, uh, you can have a bucket for your play money, 
a bucket for your donation money, a bucket for your toys money, a bucket for the saving investment, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So with that being said, I have my stuff that's covered for us way down the line. I know we have at least a million dollars now waiting for us for when we turn 55 or 65. By the time we get there and we don't add any more money in, like just in 20 years, oh. that's, that money is going to probably turn into like 10 or 20 million. You know what I mean? Because we got we started got started so young and started putting so much away at such a young age. Yeah. So the latter half of our life, we're set. Yeah. We don't have to worry about it. Because we're going to have our house, all of that. Yeah. Knock on wood, nothing happens with the fucking U.S. Yeah. But our <laughs> retirement account that we set ourselves up really good. It's going to be like 10, 20 million in the future. So now speaking into the immediate present, one of the most important things um, that you'll hear any like financial guru talk about is having three to six months of operating expenses. That's what I would say is like your first thing because your job, you can lose at any time. Even your business, like we own businesses, you can lose it at any of time. Of course. Anything we saw happen. with the fucking COVID, like, we were shut down from one day to the next. That's it. That's it. You make no more money. Yeah. We've seen stock markets crash, Bitcoin crash, all kinds of things crash. So the thing that you need the most liquid is cash because you have to be able to buy groceries. It's awesome that you got so many stocks, but can you buy milk for your baby? You know, that's what's most important. So I would highly recommend three to six months of operating specs. And so that includes your rent or your mortgage, your car payments, like everything you need to live life, your cell phone, your grocery bill, your utilities, everything so that like if you lose a job, you're literally unaffected for three to six months. So that way you can um, lose your job, get be get put in the worst situation, but don't have to worry about financial stresses. And then that way you can have full speed ahead to get back on your feet versus yeah. if you lose your job and now you can't make payments, you have you're like double fuck because you're in the corner with with two hard things to deal with. So for us, we have that that I never touch. So that's like number one. We always have our operating expenses three to six months that we never ever touch. And that kind of falls in line with uh, the Dave Ramsey baby steps. He's extremely conservative, not politically, but he doesn't even believe in debt or loans. And I kind of like that because uh, well, there's a lot of other people that have different strategies, right? Like yes. Robert uh, Kiyosaki, Kiyosaki, yeah. Kiyosaki, that is about I only want to work with debt. He only wants good debt. That's all he wants. Yeah. But the problem is, um, I think it's like the baby and the candy. Like it just syndrome. depends. Right. I mean, it's yeah. not one, not one shoe fits all. You yeah. Know? Like if you're the type of person where you can size. have a donut sitting next to you all day long and you know, oh, that's bad for me. I'm not going to eat it. There's those people. Then go ahead and play with debt. But for me, I think most people have a hard time controlling themselves, which is why as a nation, we're overweight. As a nation, we're in debt. Why like our credit is so fucked in this country. I think Dave Ramsey actually has a really good approach because he's like, Didn't just get the donut out of here. Yeah. Stop playing with the fucking donut. So he <laughs> has like, a, you know, he has like seven baby steps. His first one is um, save a thousand bucks. That's just Every to, month? No, no, no. Just have a thousand as an emergency. Oh. Because I think a lot of people, what was the statistic? I like, think like 70% of the population, at least in the US, are not prepared um, to for an emergency that's more than like $600. Exactly. Like they cannot afford that. So, so many people are living life like this, right? Teeter tottering on, on, the, on the brink of like collapse. So for him, he's like, just have the psychology to be able to have a thousand bucks. And he goes, if you don't have it in the next 30 days, this is something you should be able to accomplish. So whether you get a second, a third, or fourth, a fifth job, or sell everything that you don't need in your garage, babysit, do whatever, wash cars, but have the mindset and the ability that if I need $1,000 in 30 days, I can do it. So that's step number one. Step number two is once you have that, I think it's the, then it's the, um, oh yeah, pay off all debt. And then he has this thing called the snowball method, which I like which is start with, because there's an avalanche method and a snowball method. Avalanche method is the biggest balance, pay that off, because that is accruing the most interest, right, against your favor, and then go slowly down to the one that you only owe like 50 bucks on. For him, he goes, do the snowball method, start with the smallest, because it's all about the psychology of money. Yeah, yeah, because then you start seeing it dwindle away and you're done. And you get better and, and you're better motivated. and better and better. Yeah, when you set the first hurdle so high, it's hard to build momentum. Because you don't see it going down fast enough. Yeah, so if you have five credit cards, boom, 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 feels good versus it taking forever to pay down the $10,000. And then you have debt. the four other ones waiting. Exactly. So snowball. So second one is no debt. Then third is 
the three to six months expenses. And then I think the fourth one is uh, retirement, starting to save for retirement. Fifth one, I think, is investments in homes. Sixth one, I think, is paying off the home. Uh, and the seventh one is like starting to help. So your, before paying help, off? starting to help, help your family. Are you sure he wants it that way? It could be. I could have okay, switched I'm it. Like, because it sounds like the way he is conservative, it sounds like he wants you to pay that off, be debt free, and then at that point you can start your investment properties. Yeah, so that's the part where I'm kind of mixed up a little bit because uh, I know for him retirement is me and him on the same page in terms of retirement. You make it sound like he's your uh, he's your homie. Here well, are the baby steps that anyone can do. Yes. Baby step number one: save a thousand dollars for uh, for your starter emergency fund yep. baby step number two pay off all debt good job you have great memory except the house using the debt snowball damn you're good uh, baby step number three save three to six months um, of expenses in a fully funded emergency fund uh, baby step number four invest 15 percent of your household income into retirement good job Baby step number six, pay off your home early. That's the one. Oh. And then baby step number seven is build wealth and give. And help people around you, yeah. Yeah, damn, you good, So dude. the reason why it was so easy for me to memorize that was Does it because, make sense? No, it's because that's how, how I approached our finances. Mm. Like when I came across... Um, I mean, it seems intuitive. When I came across the Dave Ramsey seven baby steps, the first time I saw it, I was like, Okay, Bart Ramsey. That's literally what I did. Because remember, we paid, we, we've given, we've been giving my mom $2,000 a month allowance. Yeah, we pay for my mom's car. For like 10 years. Yeah. We bought your mom two cars now. Like, like we've been, we've already been on baby step seven. You know, for our house, the only thing that we did differently when we came up the million bucks on real we estate. We were going to. We were going to pay off the house. Um, but I forgot what it was, but it had to do with like the market and whatever. So we ended up buying just other real estate and then now letting that income pay for this mortgage, which now we have that and more yeah. and which I think was a blessing in disguise because once the market turns around, now we have four properties that are able to gain equity, which if you understand the finance game, like you could get HELOCs, cash out refi, like there's all these things where you can more, just different terms of being able to bank yourself. Worst case scenario, you sell off one of the properties, get that money, do whatever you need to yeah. do because so, now you have liquid cash. So just to kind of like um, every single bit, I want to kind of like conci concisation. Consolidate. Consolidate and, summar and summarize. summarize just so that. Um, Summarization. I know when it comes to finance, it could be like very hard to grasp things. So number one, we talked about um, as soon as you can. Save. Uh, yeah, save, put that away. Number two, when you're able-bodied and you have the money, try to put away for retirement because you, you trust me. 10, 10 years gonna go by like that, just like us. And I randomly pull up our retirement accounts here and there. And I'm like, oh shit, that's a lot of money. Yeah, we're good. You're gonna thank yourself in the past. And then um, three is the emergency fund, starting to have that. So now, once you have like those main things and then pay off debt, debt is a killer. It's a fucking killer. Because if you've ever been in debt, we both have, when you make two grand and you gotta put 500 bucks immediately away to like a yeah, credit card. Cause you're paying like 23, 25%, 30%. Yeah, it's imp it'll, it feels almost impossible to stack your chips like that when two grand is immediately, well two grand and then 500 is taxes and another 500 is credit card bills. Now you're only stuck with the grand. Well, and it's just bad practices, right? Like to be spending money when you owe a ton of money. Yeah. You know, like it just doesn't make sense. Like if nothing is paying for that other thing, like if it's not a strategy that you're working and it's just, it's just bad money management. Yeah. Like the way that I like to view it is trying to row the boat as hard as you can when you have a hole in it. Yeah. So water is constantly going in. So what you want to do is actually plug it. And then now when you row the boat, it's that much easier. So if you have debt, pay that off as rapidly as you can. Cause you're going to be like, Oh shit, I could actually fucking breathe. Yeah. And then, um, then you could take your time you with all the other steps, yeah, with yeah. all the other steps. Cause with debt, you can't take your time because yeah. every single month you have to pay the minimum. Yeah. And one other key term that I learned, uh, that applies to crypto stocks and real estate. Cause I think everyone that studies the market now, which I think, um, I don't want to say the average like 20 to 30 year old 
is more financially intelligent because fi financial intelligence to me comes from your results. I think they're more financially aware. So for the reason why I say that is a lot of the people that I know that are like mid twenties, late twenties, they talk about finances a lot, a lot more than I did when I was in my twenties. Um, but are they making the right actions? We don't know yet. Right. Cause it's, it's, it's hard. You're, it's young, like, still. you're still young and you're, you're still trying to figure shit out. But the key, the term that has helped me the most is called don't time the market. It's about time in the market. So everyone always feels like, oh, fuck, it's the wrong time. I should have bought Bitcoin. It was a thousand. I could have bought a house when this was happening. I should have bought that whenever that was happening. And it's always these big things that they should have done. But every single investor I ever talked to, they said the best time to invest was yesterday. The second best time is today. Because as soon as you can put time behind you, that's how you let your investments grow. So even if you're buying a, a piece of a stock, a piece of a Bitcoin, a piece of Ethereum, or even um, with real estate, they have real estate stocks called REITs. It's like, it's instead of buying a whole house, you could actually buy into a market and go, I'll put like five G's in here or whatever. And it's the same thing. And as that market grows, you reap the benefits of that appreciation. So being able to develop the habit of, okay, you know what? Maybe every month I'll put away 50 bucks, hundred bucks, a thousand bucks. It's not about the instant gratification. It's not about the instant gratification. It's not about the fast results. It's, how much little can I put away and put as much time behind me as possible? So like, you know, when you go on Zillow and you look at homes, you're like, dude, that thing's 500 grand right now. And you scroll down, there's always a graph. And you're like, what the fuck? That thing was 80 grand at one point. It's like, yeah, just over time. It's like pillow money. That guy is still doing his regular job. Yeah. But because he was able to buy early on, this thing grew so much. So imagine the same person that's buying it for 500 yeah. right now. We've seen the homes in LA go from 500 to like 2 million over the course of like two decades. So that's the other thing that is really, really important with crypto, with everything. So now it's a long game. Yeah. So now with our crypto little fun, um, I have it set, so I don't think about it. And every day it just buys a little bit. And then it's actually helped me out psychologically because right now we are in a market like a downturn. So it's like bear market. And so I almost view it as like, oh, cool, I'm buying it as, as at a savings. Because, you know, the cheaper, like, let's say Bitcoin is. Yeah. The same amount that I'm buying, I get to buy more. more. Of it. But then what's cool is once Bitcoin starts growing, all the ones I bought in the last year, now two, three, four, five X. Yeah. Know? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think it's also knowing what market you're getting into and how it grows and over time, how it, how it grows, right? Because you're always talking about dollar cost averaging. Yes. Like all the time. And, um, it can be a daunting term, but it really is you just studying the market for like decades at a time because it going up and down, up and down is normal. Like I remember being super young and then us having a housing crisis. This is before the crazy uh, the crazy um, market crash that we had in 2008, I believe. Yeah. Um, when my dad was still alive and he like I remember I didn't know enough about homes and finances and stuff, but I remember my dad like everyone's freaking out. But my dad would be like, what are they freaking out about? This happens every 20 years like look at the history this is bound to happen and it always goes up and down like nothing is ever a linear thing nothing's ever a straight line so he's like we're gonna get out of it you just have to keep sticking in it and i remember him saying that and that still applies now like in anything that you do it always has its up and down but it's literally what you're saying right the dollar cost average yeah and that actually applies <clears throat> to so many different things so like uh even outside of finance outside of housing outside any of point Anything you're trying to be successful at, you need to dollar cost average. Like the same concept. What is as, dollar cost average? So I'm, I'll explain right now. So like dollar cost average is doing a little bit every single day versus doing a ton at once. Because I think that's what most people try to do, right? They go, okay, I got to buy Bitcoin. Everyone tells me to buy Bitcoin. Oh, fuck. Bitcoin's 30 G's. Okay, I got to save. I got to save until I have like 30 G's. And it keeps growing. And it keeps growing, right? Versus, you know what? I only have five bucks. I'll buy five bucks right now. But the habits, it's about building the habits that gets you success versus trying to um, like test your success. So in fitness, and the reason why I like to draw the, the parallels, it's because it's so, it's so aligned. It's, what do you think is better? Doing 10 minutes versus, like what do you think is better? Doing 10 minutes worth of sit-ups a day or doing 300 sit-ups? What, what the fuck am I saying? Okay, what do you think is better? 10 minutes worth of sit-ups a day or 300 minutes worth of sit-ups once a month? 300 minutes first of, say it again? 10 minutes worth of sit-ups every single day. Yeah. 
or 300 minutes worth of sit-ups once a month? Um, I would say, because I know the I know the answer, I would say the 10 minutes a day. Exactly. And that applies to bench. That applies to cardio. Yeah. Everything, right? Because you're building the habits. You're actually improving. And so it's the same thing where a lot of people, they go, um, I'm going to crash diet. I'll, ju- I'll, just, I'm buy, crash I'll just buy like 300 bucks worth. Um, I'll just buy 300 bucks worth of crypto or stocks or retirement, or whatever, at the end of the month. But by the time you get there, do you know how much life happens? Flat tire. This thing happens. I got to pay for this. Oh, my car registration. Where's the 300 bucks? It's so hard. It's so much easier just to do the daily work. Do 10 bucks, 10 bucks a day versus 300. It's the same amount of money, but when you do it on a daily and habit building, it's way easier. It's not as sexy as I just dropped 300 bucks on some crypto. 10 bucks is going to get you way better than the 300. So that's what the dollar cost averaging is, which is what is the um, average that I'm going to that what is the dollar amount that I can commit to every single day and that will average the market cycles over time. Yeah, yeah. I think that's so great. same thing with fitness. What's the 10 minutes worth of exercise that I can do regardless if I'm sick or it's raining or I have to do it at home? What is something you can commit to every single day? And if you do that for a whole month, you're going to see results versus the, the person that randomly goes, I'm going to do Runyon Canyon and, and run five miles in one day. But that's not going to do much to you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. So that would say that piece um, is extremely important is uh, the investment, but then doing it in a the boring, but the most proven and most successful way. Yeah. So then at what point were you because you said there was a shift, right, where initially we were going to pay off this house with the million that we made and we were just going to live rent free. What was the turning point where you were like, well, wait a minute. Hmm. So this is where Thatch really helped me the minute. So th- how that story played out was um, when we bought our first Vegas house, there was like, you know, the gossip on the streets, dude, I think our house is going up. The house is going up. And then, and then I was like, Oh shit, for real, for real. It's crazy. And then, so I already know about HELOCs, HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit, which is, the appreciation of your house um, versus what you bought it for, that gap, you like can how take much a loan. How much the value of the land has increased? The whole property. How much that whole property, that appreciation, how much has that increased? And you can take a loan out against yourself and use that money. So, for example, if it appreciated, like, let's say um, 200 grand, usually it's 80%. So you can pull out 160, like you have cash. Yes, you have to make payments on it because it's technically a loan, but you have 160 that you can do to start whatever. a business, yeah, remodel whatever. the home, do whatever with, right? Yeah, because it's an asset. Your home is an asset. Now. Yes. So when I found out that a lot of the homes were going up in value, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to pull a HELOC. And one of the processes of a HELOC to know how much your house appreciated, you have to get it appraised. So when it got appraised, it came back for like 2.8. And I was like, oh, shit. That's Because we, we got it at like one point. One, one point two, one point three. So we got the house for one point three. So the appraisal came back more than double, which is like one point five. Right. So when we saw that, we're like, okay, that's fucking sick. And um, we didn't love the house, which was like double down. Yeah, double down. It was uh, it wasn't as cozy as we wanted it to be. So we're like, okay, cool. Now the strategy is going to be let's buy a house that is under that one point five. And then that way, when we sell this house, it'll pay for what we owe here and We'll have, have enough money, money. Le- money left over to pay off the house that we're currently in right now. The problem is, um, and this is like, this is why it takes experience. Um, the market started to turn because they're, the feds were bumping the interest rate. So as the interest rates rises, generally the real estate market slows down because it's harder to get a loan. So for example, if you have a loan at 3% uh, versus a loan at 6%, it can ch- change your monthly payment from a thousand to like 3000 bucks, depending on how much your house is. So the market started to turn, not as many people wanted to buy. And then, so our house, we listed at 2.8, 2.7, 2.6. We have to drop the price. And I, I think we ended up selling for like 2.4, 2.5, which is still crazy good. Hell yeah. It's still like over a million bucks. Hell yeah. But now we're missing the one or 200 grand to go with the plan where this one is just going to completely wipe this one clean. So now it's time to pivot. And so that's kind of like all of finance, right? Like, or in life, you're trying to pivot and always make the best move with more data, more information. 
So when we got hit with that, I was like, okay, if we can't, if I can't pay off this house and I also even, uh, hit up our loan for this house. And I was like, what if I pay off 90% and yeah. for some reason, it didn't make a difference. Yeah. The payments were still really high. I don't know yeah. why it was, but that's the way it is. I was like, well, then I'm not going to give you yeah, all that doesn't money. Make sense. So I'm like, uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy that value worth of homes. And if each one of them is paying me like two to $2,500 rent, cause they're completely paid, paid off. off that'll cover the mortgage of this house. Cause the mortgage of this house, I think was like five grand or something. So yeah. I only needed two or three homes to pay off the mortgage of this house. And so, so that's what caused me to change plans because interest rates went up. We didn't sell the house <coughs> for me. what we wanted to sell it for. It was a little bit under, it still came up a million, but now we have to just kind of like pivot and stuff. Which is in the long run, I like it more because it's that pillow money, right? Like we don't need it. We didn't need it. Like we could still comfortably pay for this mortgage and now we're just getting income on the side. Yeah. And that's the part that I want to stress for everyone out there. Um, when you buy a home, you are literally banking yourself. And that's why I was so happy we went with this route. And I'm actually happy that they bumped the interest rates because now we own four homes and three of them are pretty much banks. And the reason why I say that is when you have a home that is paid off, or if you have more equity than what you owe, that equity at any time you can cash out refi so you can pull the money out in equity and then refinance the home as if you're going to buy it from scratch or you can do a HELOC and when you have money it's easy to get money you can leverage things you know like you, you hear ballers all the time oh I need money um they'll literally go to like an asset type of brokerage and go for for this rolly like how much money can you give me like, oh, I'll give you 20 g's they have to come back with the 20 g's to get the rolly back but when you have assets you can you can leverage it and, and you can bank yourself. And so um, I'm happy because otherwise I would, we've already, we would have just had one property, but now we have four properties that we can technically bank ourselves with, especially as the market grows. Like all the properties that we got were under 500 grand, but they're gonna be 700 grand one day. So yeah. 700 times three, that's now 2.1 yeah. million. And this know? is not the end for sure. Yeah, so when it comes to <clears throat> investing, um, I also like kind of like the Warren Buffett method where he likes to diversify because any market can tank at any time. So you just never know. So because um, I think most of us, none of us are financial gurus. I think the financial gurus, obviously, they're good at finances because they're studying it as much as a pastry chef is studying pastries. And what, and what makes them a guru, right? Being in it. Yeah, being in it. So I'm sure they have their portfolio of a fuck ton of losses and mistakes and bad investments. Yeah. But then the flip to that is they have some that were really fucking successful and they rinse and repeat. Yeah. So for me, um, a lot of the stuff that I hear, I kind of take with a grain of salt because I know it's very hard to apply when it talks to when you're talking to like the financial gurus because they're in it. It's almost as if a pastry chef was teaching you how to make a pastry. And like, yeah, I just do this all the time. Yeah, it's easy. Like, yeah. Cause if you have a commercial kitchen. Yeah. Like I barely know how to make a pop tart. So the way that I like to view it is, OK, what's the pop tart way of investing? And then so one of the simplest ones that Warren Buffett does, he just kind of splits it like all equally. A little bit in real estate, a little bit in crypto, a little bit in like gold, a little bit in liquid cash. Because if a, a good investment pops up, you always want to be able to buy in whenever you can. And so uh, and spend a little bit more energy and money on the stuff that relates to you more. Because out of all the different investments and finances, some things are going to come very easy to people like, oh, I get stocks. Oh, I get crypto, you know, like Steve. Um, Anthony and Joe, they love crypto. It just clicks. They just like it. They, they understand the internet world. They understand Web3. They know blockchain. To me, I'm like, I don't know none of that shit. So crypto, I actually have the least, but I still have my finger, finger in the, the pot. Post. Like fucking, yes, yeah, straight around because I want to know what, ooh, shit. Ooh, shit. Ooh. Trying to see what's going on. But what, what I understand the most is real estate because I helped my mom rent her houses before. I understand like how to rent tenants, property managers. Uh, I've seen my mom remodel her house. I'm like, okay, yeah, I know how long construction takes. If it's like this project takes like three months. I've been with my mom in the city hall to get permits approved. So I'm like, I quite understand real estate a lot. So that's why we have so much more in the real estate realm for our investments. Well, and that just seems like it's the the more stable of the ones you just named off, right? Like it's uh, the less riskier ones, but it's also the ones that don't give you the fastest, quickest rewards. So for my, because my ass is fucking risk averse. So the reason why I like that. So the reason why I like real estate is um, the thing that makes the thing that gives real estate a nice buffer is actually the paperwork. 
So crypto, it's like this. Shoots up a thousand percent. You can go ding and literally liquidate your Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever you have instantly. Right. So because of that, the swings are like this. So if you see a stock market crash, you see Fed bump interest rate, the price of that crypto is boom, 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 boom like that. Yeah. Right. With real estate, Fed bumps interest rates. Then people are like, oh, shit. Well, it's harder to get a loan that talking to your loan officer takes two weeks. OK, I'm going to list the house. You sell the house probably takes two weeks to sell the house. Now you got to go on escrow. Escrow takes another three weeks. So all the process and uh, procedures that you have to go through creates like three month buffers all the time. Yeah, for you to cool off too. Yeah, which is why when they're studying like real estate data, they say the data that you're looking at now is never the data now. It's always data from three months ago, which makes me feel good because anytime there's a drastic change, it takes time for it to you know, kind of to go in. So for me, it's almost as if like I get to be the captain of the ship and I have a periscope and I can see what's going. You can see the iceberg way down there versus I feel like in crypto it's like iceberg, iceberg, you know, you're like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So for someone that's risk adverse like me, I like to keep it cool and chill like that. Yeah, yeah. That tends to be a lot of people. But I think also when things become popular, you can kind of get caught up in the whirlwind of like all my friends are doing it and it yeah. seems like it. Yeah, I want to do it too, you know, but you really have to know who you are and what you want in the next five, 10 years to be like, wait, is this aligning where I want to be? Yeah. I mean, I've already been to the crypto in 2017 with all the JK dudes. We bought OMG and all of us lost at least a hundred grand. <sighs> so I've been there, you know, so to me, these lessons I paid for. Yeah. Yeah. You I'm paid like, the tuition. I'm like, oh shit. I don't know if I like crypto that much. Then the second time when all the boys got into Luna, I was like, you know what? Maybe I should do the blue chip crypto. So I did mainly Bitcoin and Ethereum. I was able to get away without losing any money. I broke even, which is cool. So to me, that's a success. Attempt number one, lost 100 Gs. Attempt number two, break even. Attempt number three, hopefully, uh, now I'm like a really dollar cost average, a very little amount. We'll see what that pays off at the end later on. But hopefully it's like it's all a learning curve, you know? Yeah. And it's good if the learning curve is going this way. You don't want the learning curve. Like yeah, that. that would suck. You're not learning shit. Yeah. But because of that, I learned. I think real estate fits with me a little bit more. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. Um, What's in the works for the next year? Because like I know for this year, we're pretty locked in with these three properties because we just went so aggressive with it. What's the next phase? If there's even a next phase, is it like chill a little bit? Is it keep building, pull equity from these houses? What's yeah. the next step? So our financial, I guess, portfolio as it stands right now, we have pretty much a million in retirement. So that's good. That's also stocks because the retirement is a stocks account. Um, we have our we pretty much have a million dollars worth of real estate. So I think that that feels really, really good. We have some crypto um, under 100 G's worth and then we have liquid. But that liquid is mainly just our reserves, three to six month reserves. So I don't even count that. We're not touching that. But now because we have all of our real estate paid off, I think passively it's generating about like 8K to like 9K a month now. So if I if we wanted to and we don't touch it, which is the plan, it'll generate 100 G's a year. So in five years, that'll be 500 G's, you know, which is super cool. So we have that coming in. So the next play is the rest of this year. I think we're tapped out. I want to uh, fill up our capital reserves and then have the um, eight G's just come in and we'll keep stacking those chips. But the next play is what I'm waiting for. And it depends on what comes first. If the interest rates drop, I'm going to immediately cash out refi the other three properties because then um, I can take the cash out and have a very small loan on it because the interest rate is so low, then I'll aggressively buy again, buy again. Yeah. Um, but if that doesn't happen anytime soon, then I'm just stacking capital. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, it's now about like waiting for the market, seeing what happens to the market. How does it respond uh, while we fill up our liquid reserves? Yeah. Dope. I love it. Yeah, no, I feel super secure. I feel like we're doing the right thing, at least the stuff that makes sense for us, because I'm also super risk adverse. So anything that you ever do want to bring up, I always um, I have trust in your abilities to research and, and find the right things. And you're such a research junkie that you not only research online, but then you hit up the experts and fortunate for us, we have access to experts. So it's really dope that you do tap into it, um, that you never make a decision without considering 
the family and myself so you do your research and then you present it to me and like whatever it is that you present i'm always like okay cool i get it if i don't get it then at that point i'm like well wait 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 we got to chill out i gotta like make my own decision on this stuff but um everything you've presented i'm like dude this all makes sense like let's do that yeah and every and the way i like to learn too i like to be in the middle of the debate you know i think that's the best way to learn because like when you look at real estate, like that was like the thing in the beginning when I first got into it. I'm like, man, what should I do? Should I do like Airbnb? Everyone's doing Airbnb. Or should I do long-term rentals? Because that's what I know. That's what my mom did. Or should I do medium-term rentals? Or should I just do like flips? I heard of people doing flips, you know, just get in and get out in like three months. I also hear people about wholesaling, like off-market deals. Like, well, what is it? Like when you look at it, one of the best advice I got from a real estate agent, shouts to Felicia Rexford. She's also a real estate investor out here in Vegas. She was like, every single sector you're going to find millionaires and billionaires, public storage, parking lots, you know, uh, uh, commercial apartments, every single sector, you're going to find millions and billionaires. So is there a right way? No, it's which way best fits you. And you, the only way to do it is get your feet wet and go, no, nah, this one isn't for me. Oh, this one comes very natural. I'll do this. So it's getting your feet wet little by little, um, even going to meetups, tagging along with them, some friends, seeing how your friends are doing deals, picking people's brains and uh, putting all that stuff together. So being in the middle of like a think tank, which is why like as much as Dave Ramsey, because I, I do relate to him more as much of him I listen to. I listen to Robert Kiyosaki quite a bit, too, because he's always talking about debt and loan and all that stuff. And so I want to hear what made him a billionaire so I can understand what made this guy a billionaire. And then how does that apply and how does that going to make me successful? Yeah, yeah, that's so dope. I'm so lucky. Why are you lucky? <laughs> because it's cool. It's cool that you see it that way. And like, you're such a pattern person. Um, I remember attending uh, a seminar with Tony Robbins and he was saying like, as soon as you can figure out the pattern to things, you've unlocked a whole new world and you just operate completely differently. So it's really dope that that comes so naturally to you where you see, where you naturally see the pattern of things. Cause now you can start predicting it. And then once you understand it, the prediction comes and then now you start creating your own patterns, which then turn into like shortcuts and like, just more sound ways of, of operating. Um, and, and yeah, like me finding the patterns to things, at least in certain spaces, I don't get it. Um, but then in other realms, like you said, whatever comes naturally to you, then I, when I do get it, I'm like, holy fuck, this is tight. Cause now I can predict what these, these patterns will be. Yeah. If that makes any sense. No, it makes perfect sense. Cause that's the first part that even got us the first million in real estate to begin with is I saw the patterns in cities, right? I was yeah. like, Okay, growing up, the cities you always hear about are always master plan communities. So like Irvine, but then Irvine is everything's over a couple million dollars already. And then and why do like people like master plan communities? Because the schools are really, really good and the roads are really, really nice. And uh, the community areas safe, feels extremely safe. So I'm like, cool. I just Google something simple, master plan communities. And they're all over the place. Summerlin is one of them, but there's another one called Inspirata in Vegas. And there's some in Texas, Florida, like there's master plan communities all over the place. Then it's easy to just add top 10, top 20 master plan communities. You type, you Google that and boom, they're like, okay, cool. Maybe I'll look into real estate here. So I look at those real estate and you look at the prices, what is affordable. And then I start going, okay, what are some of the biggest complaints that people have? Cause when there's complaints, that's what makes people move traffic, not having a international airport close to them. Or if you're like me, you have to have an Asian supermarket, you know? So you, you look at all those things and then I'm like, dude, Summerlin is a no brainer right now. It's extremely undervalued. I could totally see why people would want to move to Sumlin because it's 20 minutes away from one of the biggest airports in the nation. And international it, airport. And it's an international airport. Yeah. It's a master plan community. It has a couple of blue ribbon schools. You come here and the roads are super nice. And you see the exact same thing in places like Houston, where, which I just was, like La Siena or Sugar Land. It feels just the same way. And so you can tell like, oh, wait, Irvine isn't the only Irvine or Palos Verdes or Arcadia isn't the only Arcadia. There's Arcadias in every single state. Now look at what you can afford and the ones that haven't matched that level and price, it's going to get there one day. And for us, we got lucky that it got there in a year. Yeah. But um, being able to see the patterns so that you can see like, oh, no one likes this. So if no one likes this, they're subconsciously going to look for a solution. Yeah. So if you can get to that solution first, that's how you come up, you know? Yeah. You sound like the chef going like easy. This is how you make breadcrumbs and everyone's like, uh, what, what do you, what do you mean? Yeah. yeah. You're, uh, you're not a white belt anymore, dude. That's kidding. Yeah, no, this is all super insightful stuff. And I hope that 
you know, you guys can can take away some of these gems. But even if they can't take it away from here, at least you gave resources as to who they can listen to to start building up their uh, financial portfolio. Yeah, I literally listen to them daily. Graham Stephan, Thatch, Minority Mindset, Dave Ramsey. Um, did I say one more person? You did. Uh, st uh, Graham Stephan already uh -huh. said. Oh. Graham Stephan, Model Minority, Dave Ramsey. Bigger Pockets. Thatch, Bigger Pockets. Yeah. I love Bigger Pockets. One of the best real estate uh, podcasts out there. Um, shout out to David Green. Um, he's on most of them, but they talk about everything. Short-term rentals, long-term rentals, you know, like fix everything and flips, real all estate. That, yeah. Everything. And then you get to like hear and go and you hear and they bring on real guests. You can hear people struggle. You're like, oh, that doesn't sound like me. Oh, that does sound like me. Yeah. Super rad. All right. Well, uh, anything else you want to add? No, that's it. Um, I just hope that in the future we can continue to keep building our portfolio and our little family bank and business. And the more I learn, the more I'm going to pass on to you guys because I want everyone to succeed. Yeah. And build that generational wealth. Everyone keeps talking about. Yeah. Cool. What about Barbell? Well, Barbell is always dropping new shit every all month. The time. So make sure you go to barbellbrigade.com, especially early June. We got a sick ass launch. And then end of May, we have a, a sour gummy, our pre-workout, best selling pre-workout restock and also brown sugar. Yep. So make sure you go to barbellbrigade.com. See you guys next time. Bye.